Hello and good morning, everyone. Welcome to ECUS, the Economics Canvas Hub series. Our purpose to is engender and enlighten students as seen through the eyes of our former students who have taken economics at Chabot College. Hello and good morning to our viewers of Chabot College's interview series of students who have taken economics at Chabot College. It is my very great pleasure to welcome Mr. Brian King, a 1996 graduate of Chabot College, who is currently working as a financial advisor for the firm in which he is a co-founder. I'd like to add the world is a very small place. Uh, Martin Medeiros is my colleague and fellow interviewer, um, and yet Brian has never taken a course uh, from Martin, but yet uh, Brian is Martin's financial advisor. And, and of course, as, a, as the world turns and is connected, Martin is also my ex-student. Uh, and so this should be a very interesting interview. My first question is, Brian, why did you choose Chabot College? So there's a part of me that chose Chabot College and then uh, there was a part that was really circumstantial. Uh, the circumstantial part was I was not a very good student in high school. And when I graduated high school, I didn't have a lot of options because uh, I did not prepare for what would happen post-graduation. So uh, I found myself in a situation where I knew I wanted to go to college. Uh, the ship had already sailed as far as, you know, the admission process for the majority of colleges in the area. Uh, and I started to focus on junior college. And uh, the part of the decision that was very purposeful was uh, I chose Chabot uh, because it gave me an opportunity to rebrand myself. And where I uh, went to high school, which was in Newark at Newark Memorial, uh, the majority of people who went to junior college from Newark Memorial went to Ohlone. And uh, I wanted to focus on uh, reestablishing my identity post high school uh, as an excellent student. Uh, I graduated <laughs> and when I uh, focus on the next part of my education, I, I just made the decision that I wanted to be a straight A student. And I figured that that would be easier to do uh, if no one knew me, uh, if no one had any expectations of me and uh, I could uh, establish myself and my identity and my brand however I wanted. Uh, so that's the reason why I chose Chabot College uh, specifically uh, in addition to, I wanted to have the same alma mater as Tom Hanks. <laughs> that, is, that is a very refreshing uh, and I believe absolutely accurate insight. Um, many of us, when we move and change our environments, understand that we can start fresh. If you get in a situation where everybody knows you, they have expectations, and unfortunately, we fall in those expectations. So my follow-up question is, and I apologize for this, if it's too, if it's too personal, don't answer, but uh, you went from being, you said, mediocre high school student. What was your GPA when you graduated from Chabot College? Uh, I want to, well, <laughs> there's, uh, I had a nightmare semester, which I think will come out in the interview. It led me to economics. Uh, but outside of uh, one semester, uh, I was around a 3.85, um, uh, but uh, I had the one semester where I actually uh, failed two courses and got two W's, uh, and that kind of served as a turning point in my life, which uh, led me towards economics. Isn't it interesting how we are often motivated more by failure than we are by success? <laughs> it answers a lot of questions. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I, I hear that from what you basically re recap, that when you hit the economics class, that's when kind of the rubber met the road, so to speak, in terms of maybe how you want to apply what you've learned, right? So I'm, I would just be interested if you could just describe how the economics class itself kind of changed the way you thought about things and then how you applied it uh, after Chabot. So when, when I started college, uh, I thought I wanted to be an architect. Uh, I had an interest in mechanical drawing and, um, you know, in my mind that led towards a, a future in architecture. Uh, and then I had enough smart people tell me that I would be a starving architect and that didn't sound 
terribly exciting, so I switched to engineering and uh, started to immerse myself in the math and sciences uh, that engineering requires as a prerequisite. And uh, I did not have any success with that. So going back to the previous narrative of, of my nightmare semester, uh, I took calculus, physics, chemistry, and uh, AutoCAD, which is a drawing program. Uh, and I ended up with two Fs and two Ws uh, and really kind of floated a little bit uh, as to what I wanted to do next. So when, uh, you know, I, I took advantage of Chabot uh, to broaden the topics that were available uh, and really kind of go into a soul searching process of, of figuring out uh, who I was now that I knew I wasn't going to be an engineer. Uh, and, you know, one of those courses was economics. And I remember distinctly, uh, you know, Ken Williams was my professor and uh, I remember uh, a lot of people saying how difficult the, cor the course was and how challenging it was. And, and I felt confident that, you know, if I applied myself, I would be successful. Uh, but the thing that really flipped the switch for me was at the very beginning of class uh, in, in Ken's opening narrative, he talked about uh, kind of the syllabus of the school and the, or the syllabus of the class and what we would learn. And, you know, he started to lose the audience a little bit, but then he said something that I still remember he commented, he said, uh, I am a self-made multimillionaire. I've lost it all and I've built it back. And we're gonna talk about some of those things too. So that instantly caught my attention because my family is, is I would describe uh, gray collar at best. My father was a mechanic by trade. My mother was a school secretary. I was always fascinated by wealth and money. And here was a person standing in front of me uh, at a cost of like $8 a unit, who was going to teach me how this stuff worked. Uh, so it was value. <laughs> exciting to, uh, to have, a, have a person uh, be available to me uh, uh, in, in a course that I was taking anyway. So I, I absolutely immersed myself in the subject. Um, you know, I, I tried to be in front of Ken as much as possible uh, to learn from him. Uh, you know, taking advantage of office hours just to sharpen my mind and think more economically, uh, because, uh, you know, if you look at any critical decision, there's typically an, a significant economic component associated with it. And, uh, you know, I've, I started to shape my understanding of that early, early on. If I could just maybe get a little elaboration on one of the things that you mentioned, and it kind of resonated with me, is you had this your site set on architecture, right? And when that changed for you, when you had to, in some respects, abandon it, right? I understand that how that could cause a lot of uh, anxiety for people because they, they, they lose a the direction. And what is striking to me is what seems to uh, appeal to you in economics wasn't because it gave you such a particular direction, was it could reestablish a foundation, right? that, you know, this is something, well, I need to reinvent myself, so to speak, right? You know, you don't have architecture now, but economics somehow seemed to me spoke to you because now I could better choose a new direction with economics as a foundation. Do, does that describe it in, in any way? It does. I mean, definitely in hindsight, I would describe that uh, as, you know, an, uh, an appropriate uh, synopsis, uh, mm -hmm. you know, in my world today in personal finance, uh, you know, I talk to people all the time at a point of transition and, you know, uh, many times that transition is from working into retirement and it's a very scary point for them. And, and what I uh, remind people of all the time uh, and maybe particularly of importance to this audience is I talk to very successful 50, 60, 70 year old people who have no idea what they wanna do with the rest of their life. So to ask an 18 to 22 year old to answer that question, uh, it's a difficult thing. Uh, but, but back to your uh, comment, Martin, you know, as I say, money isn't the most important thing, but it ranks up there with oxygen and <laughs> uh, like oxygen, uh, money only really matters when you don't have it. So, uh, you know, if I uh, was going to pursue myself uh, or pursue interest in the future, I knew that financial security was going to be an important part of that. And economics 
uh, could uh, start me down the process of understanding how to make smart choices with that. You later went on in Cal State and got a, a, a major in economics and finance, as I recall. Is that correct? It is. So both in your personal life and in your, your field of mentoring and uh, uh, dealing with your clients, are there any major principles in econ that you borrow from, that you use routinely, that you'd like to share with students who are about to take the course? So, uh, you know, there's, there's key fundamentals of economics that have been touched on by other speakers in this series. And, uh, you know, the one most commonly is the concept of, effort, uh, of opportunity cost. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, I am a person that does math for a living. And every decision that a person makes has a, you know, a financial extrapolation uh, of a much bigger number in the future, both positively and negatively. Um, or, you know, as I like to remind people, uh, a person that understands compound interest earns it, uh, and a person that doesn't understand compound interest pays it. So when I'm working uh, with clients, in the capacity of how to make smart choices, uh, it's always a goal-oriented process and, and wanting to understand, okay, what it is that you're really trying to achieve financially and then working math backwards to do the math. But uh, relative to the, uh, the, my transition from uh, Chabot to Hayward into the professional world, uh, the economic principle that I continue to hold on to is the concept of the normal profit. Uh, and the normal profit is what is the value of what I could be doing if I wasn't doing this? And uh, my time is valuable and I invested in a lot of different things, whether it be professional interests, activities of leisure, time with my family, self enrichment. Uh, but all of these things come back to a base value of what is my time worth? Uh, and uh, having a keen understanding of that uh, allows me to prioritize my time appropriately. Uh, so in addition to the concept of, of opportunity cost and compound interest, uh, that normal profit concept is, is something that I try and keep in the forefront of my mind. I, I, I vividly remember when I first met Brian, this is what, 90, this is almost right after you took a Ken's class, because this is like 98, right? And, uh, this would have been 1999. And, and <laughs> interestingly, Martin, you were my very first client that I was referred to. So the uh, very first client that I obtained that was not in my natural market. So this but entire experience is a great homecoming for me. What I remember was um, secretly in my mind, I, after talking with Brian, I, I, I think somehow used economic lingo like I do, which drives some people crazy. But I remember Brian's expression was almost like a... Um, somebody who is dying of thirst and they get the first drink of water, I get to start talking about uh, these economic terms. And I remember almost feeling sorry for him because I, I don't really meet economic geeks often. And I come across one and I go, it must be tough for you because you must not make many friends <laughs> wanting to talk about this. <laughs> I was happy to talk to them because I love it too. But I, I thought I was the only one who was cursed. But you know, it was nice to meet somebody else who was equally afflicted with, with that problem. But that's what I remember. But the one thing I, I got from what you just said was, you know, economics is the study of choice, right? And finance is in essence just an extension of economics. It's it's all about making better financial choices, right? But sure. what's interesting what's interesting is how you described uh, in a way how we bring in other things like psychology into economics. Because when you talk about convincing people the difference between compound interest, you know, either you 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 pay it or you receive it, right? Um, you also have to convince people the value of investing early. And that's difficult for a young person, right? You have to break down psychological barriers to get people to uh, un understand the value of a concept that for some people is very clear, but not for everybody, right? And it's always fascinating to me how you have to be, in, a, in, a, in essence, a psychologist. You've got to start to talk to people. Look, you've got to start thinking about this, even though you may not think it's important now, right? Uh, absolutely. And, you know, when uh, I had a mentor early on in my career development, uh, 
um, who he asked me the question. He said, Brian, do you know the definition of the word sacrifice? And I said, well, obviously you have an answer. So what, what is the definition of the word sacrifice? And he told me, he said, Brian, the definition of sacrifice is giving up what you want now for what you want most. And I think that is the key element of choice. And, and I deal with finances as an instrument of choice. You know, finances themselves is not the commodity that I work with. It's the thing that the client tells me that they're trying to achieve. Uh, finances is just the tool that we use uh, to get there. And, you know, when, when we have a dialogue with a client uh, and trying to understand uh, what it is that they're trying to achieve financially, the reality is the fact that mo for the great majority of people, they have never discussed this with another person. Uh, they've never gotten these concepts out of their head. Uh, and most couples, regardless of how successful they are in, uh, in their relationship, uh, they do not discuss it together. Uh, so, you know, going through the process of, of uh, working with a person to understand what it is that is most important to them uh, has a lot of psychology associated with it. Um, mm -hmm. But it, it comes back to the starting narrative of the fact that no one has ever taught how this stuff works. Uh, you know, I got a finance degree and, uh, you know, nothing of what I learned in uh, college was particularly applicable to my job. And, you know, my parents never taught me about how money works. And, you know, of course, the sick irony of this is that everybody's walking around assuming that they are the only ones that don't know how this stuff works. Uh, and they're afraid to ask the question because they don't want to look foolish. Uh, or they don't want to look like they're the only ones that don't know. So it, it's, you know, financial security is, uh, and the economic principles that drive it uh, is a critically important concept, but it's almost taboo to discuss. So, uh, you know, it takes, a, it takes a certain level of trust um, and vulnerability to even have the dialogue with the person, uh, uh, a professional, or even a friend. So um, it's uh, psychology is a huge component of it. If I could yeah. just add one thing, it, it goes back to what you said about Ken's class when Ken made that statement about, hey, I made a million dollars and I've lost it, right? I think one of the values of that statement is for Ken to admit, a, well, you know, maybe a mistake or a failure, but he said, I, I learned from it. I know. Mm -hmm. And, and that getting over that hurdle of that fear of admitting that you don't know something, uh, of admitting to a mistake opens up a world of opportunities for you just to, to say, Hey, I need to learn something. And I think, you know, uh, you were right to focus on that in my mind. And Ken was, uh, right as an educator to, to say, this is how you learn. You learn from your mistakes. Right. I want to ask a question, which I don't have the answer to. I posit that the stock market is crazy because the, re the, the, the earnings on investment is so low that I don't think it's sustainable. But to address the specific question, uh, th this market is a bit of a head scratcher. And uh, you know what seems to be catapulting the market is government stimulus. And to give a basis of comparison, uh, when we had the financial crisis in 2007 to 2009, uh, and the government stepped in with, with economic bailout, uh, the value of that was approximately $800 billion, uh, and it was deployed over the course of about 18 months. Uh, when we had COVID, uh, the, level of, uh, the level of infusion that the market received was in excess of $2 trillion, and it was received within 45 days. So much in the same way, if you take adrenaline and put it right into the heart, it's going to start beating again, but it doesn't necessarily uh, give you a, a prescription of health. Uh, the market right now is addicted to stimulus, in a person's opinion. And uh, there are a lot of fundamental concerns associated with how are companies generating profits and, you know, is growth sustainable? Uh, because there are a lot of people that don't have jobs. Uh, and they don't have income, and a significant percentage of our economy is consumer-based. So if people aren't working, people aren't earning money. If people aren't earning money, they're not spending money. And if they're not spending money, how is the market growing? 
So, um, you know, I look at it through the eyes of, of very cautious optimism, but uh, days like today where I'm seeing a lot of red on my screen uh, are not surprising. <laughs> yeah, so <clears throat> if you could speak directly to a student, uh, not necessarily an economics student, uh, but just a Chabot student uh, in general, what advice would you have them uh, or give them about to take their first economics course? To take a, uh, to take a topic from a, uh, a professional coaching program for our industry, uh, strategic coach, uh, if you don't know how to build a brand, uh, I would start with four simple principles. Uh, and they are show up on time, do what you say, finish what you start, and say please and thank you. And as simple as those four things are, if you build a brand, a brand with that as the foundation, you will have a brand that is exceptional because the majority of people do not show up on time, do what they say, finish what they start, and say please and thank you. Be a master of communication. There is nothing more marketable than the ability to effectively communicate. And in the course of human history, there's probably been 100 to 150 amazing ideas. And so many times people burden themselves with the thought that they have to come up with the next amazing idea if they're gonna be uh, secure or uh, uh, create uh, you know, a lifetime of convenience for themselves. And the reality is for every one great idea, there are probably a thousand people that are responsible for trying to communicate that idea. So put yourself in the majority. Uh, in addition to the economics course that I took with Ken, the second most important course that I took at Chabot was public speaking. <laughs> and you know the ability to stand in front of a room and organize thoughts and effectively communicate them is going to make you incredibly marketable regardless of what industry you go into or area of uh, education you pursue. So in summary then, uh, Martin, you were my ex-student. Brian, you were too. Uh, you're both very talented, energetic, honest, authentic people. And I'm looking forward to meeting again in a different venue, I think for our mutual benefit. So I have no more questions. It's been a great interview. Thank you, Brian, uh, for taking your very, very, out of your very busy schedule to talk with us. I am positive students will profit from this. And guess what? If my equation is correct, so will you. <laughs> well, I, I appreciate the opportunity. Thank you so much. Bye-bye.